In the Schuylkill River, this is a large landscape. You want to think about the Schuylkill River, the river's history. Um, we're talking about 130 miles from headwaters to mouth. Uh, 2,200 miles of streams feed the Schuylkill River, uh, almost 1.2 million acres. So depending on where you are in the watershed really does make a difference on the impression that you might have of the Schuylkill River. Uh, you can see here going from top left clockwise, counter, uh, clockwise from Schuylkill Haven to the Schuylkill Gap to the middle Schuylkill to the iconic images of Boathouse Row. It depends on where you are in the watershed, but uh, it also depends when you are in the watershed, uh, what impression of the watershed you might have. Let's go back a couple hundred years to Benjamin Henry Latrobe, who was asked uh, to recommend to the city of Philadelphia what would be the best water supply that the city could use. And after looking uh, at a couple of different sources, ultimately his recommendation between the Delaware and the Schuylkill, he recommends the Schuylkill for its waters of uncommon purity. It's kind of interesting, um, I was actually looking into the use of this phrase, waters of uncommon purity. And when you look into how it is used in that period of time uh, in books uh, written in the 1700s, again, this is late in the 1700s, but it refers not to, it seems to refer not to just clean water, a healthy water. It almost seems to be a phrase used for waters that have healing powers. Uh, so, of course, city of Philadelphia acts on Latrobe's recommendation, adopts the Schuylkill River, changes really the course of the river's future um, by uh, becoming the city's, uh, an important part of the city's water supply. You can see here the waterworks, uh, Fairmount, where uh, the art museum will one day be, but here is the, where Reservoir is uh, located at, at this point in time in the early 1800s. Um, so that's the city's water supply. But let's go not even 100 years beyond when uh, Latrobe picked his waters of uncommon purity as the recommendation for the source of the city's water supply. And you see some things written in the New York Times which seemed to, during this period of time, the New York Times seemed to enjoy writing a lot about how bad Philadelphia's water was. <laughs> so I just, you know, kind of looking at some of these things written in the late uh, 1800s, and it kind of makes you concerned about what the city of Philadelphia and any other community using the city's uh, water, uh, using the Schuylkill's water supply, makes you a little concerned about what they might have been drinking. Um, and that, I noticed the last, um, uh, item there on that list referring to the river on fire. Um, you can actually, and again, for, for those of us of a certain age, you know, Cuyahoga River Fire is sort of a, one of those moments in time we think of as a, a, a keystone moment in environmental history. Actually, if you go back and look in history, you'll find a lot more uh, stories about rivers burning. Um, it really wasn't that, unfortunately, wasn't that uncommon. In fact, there's records of the Schuylkill burning at least twice. And, and part of the problem apparently is that it became such a common thing it really wasn't reported on. In fact, these two times where the river burns, where coverage of it made it into papers, it seems to be connected to both instances there was loss of life associated with those fires. So what happened between Latrobe's recommendation and the New York Times writing in the late uh, 1800s? Well, uh, we have an industrial revolution. We have industry located uh, where industry can conveniently operate and grow and thrive. And one of the things that industry really needed to grow and thrive at this point was it's really nice if there's someplace convenient we can just throw away the stuff we don't need. And right along a riverbank, that seemed like a good place to do it. So if you think about all this list of, of industries you see here, it's a little bit different than when we think of industry now. But these industries would have been located along the Schuylkill River in the mid 1800s, uh, getting rid of their waste into the river at this time. And uh, you notice slaughterhouses on the list? I hope, hope you noticed slaughterhouses on that list. 
Dr. Charles Cresson, the chemist uh, who did a lot of research in the mid-1800s on the Schuylkill River, he noticed the slaughterhouses. He really wasn't very happy about them. You can see here a quote from uh, a report he wrote in 1875 about really wishing the slaughterhouses weren't dumping their waste into the Schuylkill River. It is interesting to note when he is talking about the fact that these slaughterhouses are dumping their slaughterhouse waste right into the same place that the city is taking its drinking water from. He is later talking about it. It's not that he thought that they shouldn't be able to dump their waste in the Schuylkill. He just really wished that they would dig a, a, a canal along the river, and it would go into the canal, and that canal would dump into the Schuylkill River below Fairmont Dam, so it wouldn't really be affecting the water supply. So, um, and again, it's not just the industrial uh, waste issue. You had a sewage treatment issue. This is something that when I tell people this information, they still, they're like, really? Okay, 1875, new, no U.S. city with 100,000 population or more has any kind of formal sewage treatment. Okay, 1944, less than 300 sewage treatment plants in Pennsylvania. That's really not that long ago. So, now again, Philadelphia's problem is, is not a unique problem with the industrial waste, with the sewage uh, issues. Uh, this is um, from a, a British magazine, Punch. You see, if you can't read clearly, I'll read off for you. Father Thames introducing his offspring to the fair city of London and an offspring again. Father Thames is that kind of shapeless, unattractive blob <laughs> over on the right. And his offspring are scrofula, diphtheria, and cholera. So, uh, which makes this next uh, quote from Dr. Cresson all the more interesting. The Schuylkill is occasionally charged with an amount of sewage exceeding that carried by the River Thames. Uh, unless some precautions are soon taken to prevent the influx of this great amount of sewage of animal matter, we may certainly expect to have our city visited by some epidemic scourge. Now, again, he's writing this about the Schuylkill. But he really believed the Schuylkill River had some natural advantages that made it really perfectly appropriate as drinking water supply. Sulfuric acid. Free sulfuric acid from the mines, uh, the mine workings in the headwaters. He actually thought that this was something that added value, oops, sorry, added value to the Schuylkill River as a drinking water supply. Uh, and he, this goes back to, um, so again, just he's talking about mine drainage, to be clear. And uh, what he, this goes back to is he was working at a facility that uh, had people working in close contact with the river um, during an epidemic outbreak. And they put a little, little, little sulfuric acid in their drinking water <laughs> during that period of time, and he felt that none of those folks got sick. So he believed a little sulfuric acid in your drinking water would, would kill the bad stuff in your water and make the water better for you to drink. And this concept, this idea that mine drainage killed pollution and made the water better for you to drink, this actually, this continues to exist for quite a long time in Pennsylvania. But we've, we've touched on now the, one of the things that makes the Schuylkill different, makes the Schuylkill's history different from a lot of other rivers going through the same sort of, the same sort of issues with growth, industry, sewage treatment, and how to deal with this, these kinds of issues. So let's talk about coal mining. Again, now, you look at the Pennsylvania anthracite region. This is it. Um, right here, you can see on the bottom there, you can see the Schuylkill running through Schuylkill County. That is the southern anthracite. Move up above, that kind of uh, two, you've got the eastern and western middle fields, and then you've got the northern fields. That's 75% of the world's anthracite. Right there. That's it. So what happens is, 1815, it's now, uh, again, coal, coal, anthracite coal had been known in the headwaters, but there really wasn't a push to go get it yet. And we'll get into that. Um, but by 1815, there is a push to get it. One of, again, one of the reasons pushing, suddenly let's be looking for some other fuel sources. Philadelphia, again, had been blockaded during the Revolution, uh, excuse me, War of 1812, blockaded. And it was actually hard to get fuel in to the port of Philadelphia. So there was, there was another reason why people were interested in looking for 
Well, wait a minute. Don't we have some of that stuff up in the headwaters that burns? Maybe we should go get that. So the canal is going to make that possible. So again, like I said, anthracite to begin with, uh, stone coal, hard coal, rock coal, these are all terms for anthracite because it really is, it did not burn readily. So by about 1808, though, you have some people who've been looking at this. You know, the story is that uh, Wilkes-Barre Tavern owner Jesse Fell learns how to uh, burn anthracite in a grate, and this starts to uh, uh, in enhance the adoption of anthracite as a fuel. So by 1814, you have mines opening in the Schuylkill's headwaters. Just to give you an idea, the uh, amount of the tons of coal that came out of the, the Schuylkill's headwaters in 1808 was 300 tons came out. 1824, 1825, is 1825 when the, when the canals open, is up to 43,000 tons coming downriver. By 1917, that's the peak year for anthracite extraction, 100 million tons extracted. And that's kind of what that looks like. Now, this is actually just slightly up and out of the, the watershed up in the, the Shenandoah area. Um, but you have, uh, really, you had a race to, for a couple of different reasons, different things driving, but a race to get this anthracite coal out of the ground. Now, when coal comes out of the ground, initially, again, probably the first uh, coal brought out of the ground wasn't necessarily prepared for market. But ultimately, that became part of especially anthracite marketing uh, anthracite as a clean coal, it was important to do this preparation. Uh, preparation is breaking it into sizes that need the, the appropriate sizes for burning, cleaning out the impurities, separating them out, and then even, if necessary, breaking it down to other sizes. So we talk about uh, coal preparation that's happening at a breaker. And one of the reports uh, found uh, that I looked through some of the information in looking um, for uh, this research for the book, uh, River Again, one report we found uh, said that the actual, the amount of fines, so when you're breaking the coal up, how much breaks into these smaller pieces. In the southern anthracite, um, because of the geologic processes that happen in the southern anthracite, that you actually ended up with a higher percentage of fines when you're breaking up the coal in the southern anthracite than in some of the other regions. So uh, just a couple of terms that I'll use. Comb, again, we're talking to, this is waste. Uh, it can be up to look, 30 40% coal. Uh, sometimes, especially if you're talking about uh, waste from uh, preparation that use water process, it'll be refer you might refer to silt. Uh, fines is anything that tended to be uh, uh, less than an eighth of an inch. Because again, sometimes when you hear the word fines, people are talking about coal fines and small coal or coal waste you might be thinking of really tiny, tiny pieces. So like fines tends to be the, uh, an eighth of an inch or less, but up until about the 1900s, because the coal, smaller particles of coal would fit too tightly together, it would be too hard to get them to burn, anything less than about seven eighths of an inch or less was waste. Now those are now, those would be burnable sizes of coal. But they were waste at this time. So again, think about anything like smaller than the width of your thumb as a piece of coal, that was a waste product. So all of this, the shale, the waste, the material that's coming out has to go somewhere. This is a breaker. This is an abandoned breaker in 1970s uh, photograph taken. Um, and that is not a breaker built into a mountainside. That is a breaker and coal waste piled behind it. This gives you some more ideas of what that waste looks like on the landscape. You can see this is this little community right down here. And this is coal waste all around. And it wasn't just going to be out in a rural area. This is a photo of Scranton. So, and, and these piles um, are actually problematic in communities because what you can get, they can catch on fire. Um, they have you know, pyrites in them. You can be leaching acid out of these piles. Um, people would sometimes go pick coal out of these piles at points in time. And you can have slides, and so they're dangerous. Uh, sometimes kids would go play in them and get crushed. So these were not necessarily uh, considered an amenity to your community, but this was part of the operation of breaking coal, of preparing coal, so that coal was available to burn. And again, how did that waste get separated? Well, um, you've heard, you probably heard the phrase breaker boys. Um, they, you had kids. Um, they are not supposed to be. 
They were not supposed to be any younger than 14 years of age, uh, but you often had kids younger than 14 years of age uh, working in the mines. And these are two photos uh, that kind of show you that environment in which the breaker boys are working. And uh, you will always see a guy with a stick somewhere in a photo of the breaker boys. There is always a guy with a stick. Um, reluctant to think about what the guy with the stick is there to do. Um, but um, you also notice in some of these photos, again, the photo on the lower left, the title of that photo is Noon at the Breaker. And just so you can see, that photo is actually to be able for our presentation today. I've kind of lightened it up a little bit from the initial, the digital image that I've uh, presented here uh, that's been lightened up a little bit so that you can actually see uh, more of what's happening in the photo. Because one of the things I want to point out, you can see the black around their faces, around their nose and mouth, from where they're taking, you know, they're breathing in coal silt, breathing dust and coal silt. Also, uh, I, I noticed, um, again, this is just looking at these photographs over time, I've noticed that what you see is their hands are almost always bare. And in looking at um, these photos, um, I realized every single photo, gee, why don't these kids, you know, it's got to be cold. You know, they're all bundled up. Why aren't they wearing gloves? Um, I read at one point that one of the reasons why is it's so dusty for the kids that are doing this picking out, picking the coal, that you really, they had to have, it was so hard to see. You had to have your hands bare to be able to figure out what you're doing. Now, it's interesting uh, to look because there's a period of time where you have a lot of uh, organizing around child labor and getting children out of the mines. And it's sort of an interesting response that as the, uh, the industry is responding to, we need to get children out of the mines, they adopt wet process for cleaning coal. So in the early 1900s, they're starting to adopt this wet process for cleaning coal. Uh, it, and again, it's just as they're sort of phasing out of doing the um, uh, using uh, child labor, we're going to this wet process where they have these separators that the coal goes in, the uh, heavier materials are settling out on the bottom, the coal is kind of floating here, they take some stuff that they're skimming off the top, and then they get rid of the waste. They're discharging the waste. Um, now, this wet process is really when, it's, okay, we can't use child labor, well, how else are we going to do this in a cheap manner? Well, I guess we'll just have to discharge it to streams. That's the way we'll do it. Uh, and so, if, for example, where you were uh, in the mining region had an impact on how much waste is really being discharged. If you notice, there's this, this report here. In, a, sol in a, a cubic foot of wash water, if you're in the upper Lehigh, was less than a pound of solids in that wash water. But if you were in the Hazleton area, it was over, almost, you know, it was over two and a half pounds. So that's a lot of material. And we end up with streams that have sediment issues that look like this. So this report, there's a report done in 1916. Uh, actually, it was, it was uh, ordered a couple of years earlier uh, to pretty much it was a collection of, of assessing all of Pennsylvania's uh, uh, water resources and, and other resources. And, this report, one, one of the volumes deals just with the anthracite waste. And in that report, this report is, is issued in 1916. And it reports says, contamination of streams in the coal region has been in progress for more than 50 years. And that's one of the things I found really interesting when I read that statement, because you'll have people who say, well, you know, we really didn't know. They didn't know what they were doing. They didn't realize that it was causing pollution. Clearly, you know, they're saying here, we've, we've known this has been in process for 50 years. So you, you go take 50 years back from 1916, you're talking about before the Civil War. Now, again, primarily in talking about this in this report, they are talking about the acid mine drainage as being a problem. But they also are talking about in this report, there's another place where they refer to, because of the volume of sediment that has gone into the Schuylkill River, among others, they talk about saying that they believe the Schuylkill River is not going to be usable as a water supply for industry, for drinking water, for 150 years. Because it's going to take that long for the river to be cleaned up, to be cleaned up, just flowing, letting it left to itself. And again, that's in 1916 if you stopped then. So, um, but again, realizing, thinking of the volume of waste now that is going into our waterways, 
Um, we're very enterprising people. <laughs> and we said, you know, hey, we can mine some of that stuff because we now figured out how to use that. Let's go mine some of that stuff out of the river. So there were actually, there were coal operations mining coal out of the river because there was so much coal in the river. One year, we know how much was taken out, which was taken out in 1919. 235,000 tons of marketable coal was taken out of the river. We know because in 1919 a study was done, how much marketable coal do you think is in the river in case those miners go on strike, how much, how much coal are we going to be able to still have access to? That's what this, this report that was done at this point in time. But again, part of the problem is 235,000 tons is what came out of the river. At the same point in time, every year from other breakers and other places, there's still two to three million tons going into the river. So you're only taking, you're putting two to three million tons in it every year, and in one year, okay, well, they took out 235,000 tons this year. Still a lot of pollution going on. So this is where we are. So concern is growing, and, and in the early 1900s, there's a, a push to get the Corps of Engineers involved, Corps of Engineers involved, and they're sort of like, well, we really don't want to do that. Um, but they do some studies. They do get involved and they do some studies at points in time through the early 1900s, 20s, 30s. For example, they're estimating that in 1927, they're estimating that about 38 million tons of coal sediment is in the Schuylkill River. That's a lot. Um, just to give you, a, you know, an idea, but through 1963, it's been estimated that the total number of, total amount of fine waste produced in the southern anthracite was 70 to 80 million tons. Okay, and again, they're saying that in 1927, the engineers, Corps of Engineers estimated that 38 million of that was in the river. So in addition, we have mine water, acid mine drainage going into from being pumped out of the mines so they can get into the deep mines. They're talking about the, the Schuylkill River runs acid to its confluence with Maiden Creek, a limestone-based stream in the Reading area. So for the first 45 miles of the Schuylkill River are acid. So you've got this, this push. There's an interest in doing something around the Schuylkill River and doing something to clean it up. Nobody really knows what they're going to do, but there is, there is this push to start doing something about it. And then um, you have a cleanup delayed because um, anthracite coal continues to be an important fuel for industry, it's an important fuel for the military, uh, it's important fuel for World War II. Um, just, in, in, just in general to kind of give you an idea how anthracite was, uh, was viewed, um, I recently read uh, something written by an admiral in the period of time after World War I where he was taking the position that the United States should seize all the anthracite reserves and hold them for the Navy. Um, because he refers to a battle in which the um, uh, naval ships burning bituminous coal were spotted by the enemy, but if they had been burning anthracite coal, they would have been able to be unseen. So he's saying that we need to, his position was, we need to seize the anthracite reserves and hold them for the Navy. So again, we have this period of time in the uh, during World War II where there is a push to get more coal out of the mines. And in fact, if you look on this, this sign, I don't know how well you can see it here. If you're following on your app, you might be, or on your phone, you might be able to see. In the lower left-hand corner, uh, right-hand corner, you see the sign that says, take care, idle hands work for Hitler. So if you're a miner, you know, this is, there's a lot of information here saying, you know, you really need to get in the mines. You need to be producing coal. So what that results in, as by the time that World War II is starting to wind down, we're starting to look at a Schuylkill River that has been referred to as too thick to navigate, too thin to cultivate. So this is just an interesting figure to me. By 1944, almost half of what is being dredged out of the tidal Schuylkill, over 100 miles down from the headwaters, over half of what is being dredged out of the tidal Schuylkill is mine waste. So they're finding traces of comb on the Delaware 10 miles upstream, 30 miles downstream because of the tidal movement. They're finding comb in the Delaware. 
think about just how far downstream. They're actually, again, associated with the military because of the uh, naval yard. There was concern that um, the Schuylkill might be, they needed to keep the Schuylkill open because of national security for the naval yard. So that also starts to be a factor, again, as the war is, is sort of winding down here, that something needs to be done for the Schuylkill River. So um, one of the uh, lucky, very lucky uh, uh, things that happened in the course of putting the book together was to find these photos in a collection of the Springford Area Historical Society taken by uh, a photographer named Harold Amster uh, in the period of time where this, uh, the cleanup is happening. Because even if you know the volume of coal that is supposed to have been in the river, until you see some of these images that show you what the river looked like at that time, it really is hard to grasp what the Schuylkill was like in the past. So you look at this photo here. This is a photo looking from sort of where Penhurst was, looking up toward Linfield. And that winding little tiny stream is the Schuylkill River. Think of the middle Schuylkill now. That's the Schuylkill River. Look at the sediment through which that river is winding. These are some more uh, images that are used. This is a promotional piece that was put out by the um, Department of Forest and Waters, which would later become ultimately what we um, at DEP. Uh, Department of Forest and Waters putting out this to kind of show you, and again, full color photographs to show you the volume of Schuylkill uh, of sediment accumulated along in the Schuylkill's banks. So, um, you know, when any project like this happens, it's never really down to one person. There were lots of people pushing to make this happen. But for me and for the, the research that I've done, there's one individual that really sort of stands uh, head and shoulders above a lot of the other folks that worked on the Schuylkill River, worked to address the problems of the Schuylkill, and that's James Henderson Duff, first as Attorney General, uh, and then as governor, and then later as senator. Um, James Henderson Duff was from western Pennsylvania. He was uh, really not a lifelong politician. He was involved in politics, but he's, he was an avid outdoorsman. And he really very much believed that we needed to have clean water for health, clean water for uh, hunting and fishing, clean water for industry. Um, and uh, so he really pushed cleanup of the Schuylkill River in many ways, cleanup of rivers around Pennsylvania in many ways, because as Attorney General, he writes opinions to guide state regulators that, in, based on like the Clean Streams Law that passed in 1937, he is really telling them, yes, you have power to go and enforce uh, against this industry. You have power to go and enforce sewage treatment uh, needing to be addressed with this city. And it sounds like, by the way some of this stuff happened, it sounds like it was sort of like, well, you go talk to them, and he was talking to the Sanitary Water Board at the time, you go talk to them, if they don't seem to uh, be receptive to you, let me talk to them. And I really wish I could find some of those records of whatever happened in those conversations, because it sort of seems like you have articles in the press where a uh, uh, mayor of a town is saying, we're not going to do anything. And then after meeting with <laughs> Attorney General Duff, we're going to work on this. So he must have been very persuasive. Um, so James Henderson Duff also uh, is, uh, appears to be the person who wrote the Desilting Act, which is really what gets the cleanup of the Schuylkill River underway. Uh, and, and this is, again, focusing on the mining impact, the, the sediment that has been discharged in the Schuylkill River. It authorizes this cleanup. It authorizes acquisition of land. About 1,500 acres are required for the project. It authorizes uh, working with um, the federal government. This is Pennsylvania's first joint state project. And in fact, what's going to happen is Pennsylvania is going to do the part from the headwaters to Norristown. Once they have removed half the sediment that's in the river, federal government's going to kick in and do its part from Norristown down. So uh, then, then he becomes governor. And in the, in the role as governor, he uh, is now in a position to really make sure this project gets underway. What he does, he uh, appoints a retired admiral, uh, Milo Dremel, to head up the Department of Forest and Waters. And Milo Dremel turns to people he knows. He knew that actually some of these uh, engineering firms, some of these folks have military background. Uh, for example, Harrison and Deccant Associates, um, both of those folks uh, had military background. And um, Deccant, uh, for example, actually comes from uh, a family from the Reading area, and Frederick Deccant probably knew about as much of the Schuylkill River as anybody knew at that time. And each of these different firms 
uh, had different specialties that they brought to the project. And together, these four firms, Harrison Deccan, Dan Zimmerman, Albright and Field, Justin Courtney, they are the Schuylkill River Project engineers. And their plan, very simple, stop discharging coal waste in the Schuylkill River. Use the river's flow to get coal waste where you can take it out, take it out, mine it, reuse it, um, and then stop anything else that is in the system from moving further down. And then they also wanted to allow the river to sort of move more freely back in its channel. So um, again, part of the first uh, effort, they had to do all the land acquisition to be able to build the places where they're going to put the sediment once they take out of the river. But in a very important early uh, step was surveying. Uh, and the, for during the book, for doing the research, I actually got to talk with an individual who was involved in that process and his experiences and very interesting to inform what had happened as far as the surveying efforts. So just to give you an idea of what this is here, is this is a cross section of Schuylkill. This is up above uh, Reading here. And what they would do is they'd kind of go every three feet and they'd take these measurements. It's like how far down to a hard bottom. Then go, keep, go a little bit further and kind of just keep going through the sediments, how much water, how much to the bottom. And then they would make these measurements and predict, OK, this is what we think the cross section looks like. So what you're seeing is at this section, the river is 370 feet wide. There's three feet of water and 26 feet of sediment at that deepest spot. So again, dam removal. Uh, they, they removed one of the very first parts of this project was there were five dams in that area around Schuylkill Gap. They went in and removed these five dams. This is what dam removal looks like in the uh, late 1940s. And they built dredges specifically for this project because the river was so shallow. Now, they, again, they started dredging before their custom-built dredges were ready, but this is one of the custom-built dredges that they built for this project. And this is not a sensitive project. It is not sensitive to the Schuylkill River. This was uh, a project to go in and cut the sediment out. This is a cutter head you see there in the front. It spins around. You see those blades. They're spinning around, cutting into the sediment. And it is sucking the sediment through that long pipe that you see there and out the back, out the other end, through this long sections of piping going all the way into that kind of football stadium looking like thing over there. That's, a, that's one of the basins, the impounding basins, where they're going to trap the silt. This is the construction of one of these impounding basins. They have very, very large berms uh, around them. And, uh, and they put, like I said, there was about 1,500 acres. Some of these are 20, 30, uh, 40 acres. I think there's a couple that are even larger than that. And you notice, like, right where they are, they're right next to the banks of the river. Um, so I've always thought of, you know, what did the, you know, that impact? What did the impact of taking this land out of the floodplain and enclosing them in these bermed impounding basins? And this is what they put inside the basins. This is sediment being pumped from the dredge into the basin. And if you can't get a good close-up view of what that slurry looks like, we'll do this one for you. So that's the sediment being cut out of the river, pumped through the dredge into the basin. Um, and how the basins worked, again, is this is a drain. And you can still find these in somewhere like over in the Black Rock Sanctuary. You can find a drain. You can find the drain to see what it looks like. So what happens is you see where those openings are. All those different slats, those are doors. And so what you can, what you can see is the, um, on the side, you can climb up, and there's cabling on each of these sections. And you can go and you can pull these cables. And so you can open and lower those doors. So what happens is the water level comes up. The sediment is settling out and the decanted water flows back into the drain. And there's a pipe in the bottom that goes out and goes back out into the river. So that's how that was the way that these uh, basins operated. In some places, there wasn't actually a place to put a, a, a basin. You couldn't even get into dredge. Uh, Reading and Philadelphia were very difficult, difficult areas to find because they were all developed. There was no place to put one of these impounding basins in which to pump. And you couldn't even necessarily get in with a dredge, so you got in how you could to remove the sediment that you could. And uh, these basins have only been mined by one company ever, Stouts Ferry Preparation Company. Um, there was initially, when they put the bid up, the, the people behind the project thought, oh, we're going to make money. This is like river coal. People will just buy this the same way they were buying river coal. No. For whatever reason, no one bid on this project the first time it was put out. Second time it was put out, two companies bid. Um, and uh, Stealth Ferry Preparation Company was the winning bid. 
And they have the only, they've been the only company that has ever mined these. And some of these are still being mined. This is actually from just a couple years ago. Uh, this is Abrams Basin down in Montgomery County, where they were taking out, mining out some of the coal, separating it out into coal, sand, different um, components, and uh, using them to, they actually like to use charcoal briquettes is how the, the fines have been used in that, um, how the, the way that the material is extracted from these basins have been used. So um, what, uh, what um, this slide to me is a very interesting slide. It kind of really takes in a lot. So when you, think of, when, you, when you think of a river, you tend to think of you know, a river in the bottom of a valley. You know, valley might have a different shape. If you look at this, like I said, there's a couple of different things going on. If you look at the river is actually sitting above where its floodplain should be over here. So, and if you think, and again, this is not an island in the middle of the Schuylkill. This is where this dredge is operating. You have had material that has been pushed into the river where the dredge can get it. So really what they are doing is they're just pushing everything they can to get it to the dredge. To give you a better idea what that looks like, everything they can, they're pushing to the dredge for the dredge to be able to cut this and in, cut into this. And, and again, when they're pushing everything, it wasn't always the easiest operation. Like I said, the individual um, that was involved in the surveying, the surveying didn't just happen before the project. The surveying happened throughout because dredgers got paid by the quantity of material they dredged. So they had to have an idea of how much was there to begin with. Before a dredge operated, they'd go in and survey. And then they had to go in and survey after the dredge operated to figure out how much the dredge removed. So they were around all the time while they were watching this stuff happen. And uh, he talked about the the kinds of the debris, the material in the river, um, all the, like I said, the dredges were breaking down all the time. They always had, they're always cutting into, you know, he's talking about like, the, like old um, Native American fishing weirs that they would run into and cut into um, just because, they, you know, again, they're just pushing everything in there. They're cutting into the river, they're cutting into the bed. And again, there's, there's a lot of material that had been, you know, pushed into the Schuylkill River in other ways before this point in time. And again, they're also doing things like they're trying to you know, remove this material that is accumulated in places in the floodplain. Again, I'm going to stress, this is not a really sensitive project. This is in the Birdsboro area. This is what they're called a channel rectification. So see what they're doing here. See the amount of material that they're plowing through here to clean out around this bridge in Birdsboro. So this is the before. That's the after. So there is a lot of clearing that was done to make the river flow again in a way that they thought was the appropriate way the river was supposed to flow. So um, again, part of this uh, was to trap any sediment uh, that any, the coal sediment that is in the system upstream. And the way they thought they were going to do that is they create dams, dams, traps, dams trap sediment behind them. This is Kernsville Dam under construction. The way that they did these dams was they flow the river around one side while they've got this area in a coffer dammed area that they are working on one side, then they did the other side, and then you have ultimately Kernsville. So you have, you, have, you have a dam at Kernsville, you have a dam at Auburn, and you have a dam at Tamaqua. And these were the dams that were built to trap the sediment that was still in the system. So by 1951, that's the official Schuylkill project, though the Schuylkill project still, the Schuylkill River project still exists within, the, within DEP now, within the Department of Environmental Protection now. It still exists as a project. Dredging continued throughout up until uh, I think like early, maybe even late 70s. Um, and so, but for the, the four years of the project, um, where it was officially the Schuylkill River project was underway. Um, so this is some of the stats from the project, 23 impounding basins, 120 people employed directly, um, but there was a lot of subcontractors. Because again, this was, this was pro promoted as a jobs project for men returning from World War II. So that was, and again, some of the, the people that I talked to that were involved in the project directly were people who um, had been involved uh, in the, had been in the military, had been coming back looking for work. Um, one of the significant things about this is that this project and associated with it, the mining operations finally were required to have their own preparation plants. They were not just allowed to keep putting um, material back into the waterways. And um, well, it was kind of interesting, that dredging that was happening that you saw. The first couple years when the dredging started, 
the mining, uh, mining was still, uh, mining operators were still putting uh, material discharging directly into the waterways, even though the dredging was going on downstream, they were still discharging without their coal, their own coal preparation plants. Um, so the, uh, interestingly enough, in the final report, you would think there would be more highlighting of the total volume of, of sediment, but it actually sort of hard to find the actual total amount that was, uh, that was removed. At least 16 million tons appears to have been removed from the Pennsylvania portion of the project. Total cost uh, was 31 million today. That would be probably in the range of over 300 million. Again, that's just inflation telling you how much that's going to be in a project like this would not, could not happen today. So below then, so after 51, we get into 52. Uh, and below uh, Norristown is when the federal government comes in and starts to do their part. And um, with this uh, dredging below Norristown, um, what you end up having is um, multiple dredges all pushing into like one booster station and then that booster station pushing stuff further downstream because, again, where were you going to put an impounding basin? Um, it's very interesting and especially in, in, with some of the, the presentation today, later you're going to be hearing from some people about Eastwick. Um, this is one of the areas where some of these materials were sent. Um, you may know another area where materials were going to be sent. It was uh, owned by the Sun Oil Company. It was a popular birding area. And some folks uh, heard about uh, this area was being targeted for putting the sediment. And they organized to protect this area. And actually, there's some of the environmental organizations like Natural Lands Trust sort of have their... They, they, they grew out of this movement to protect this particular property, which you would know now as the John Hines National Wildlife Refuge that was proposed to be filled with uh, these sediments at one time. So um, just to give you an idea of kind of what that looked like, you, know, you actually have done here, uh, you, have, you have rowing happening on the river, but you've got dredging in the background. If you can see the dredge uh, along the far shore there. And here's um, dredging where you see this is one of the booster stations where you've got a couple of different pumps a uh, couple different pipes from different dredges coming in on the right-hand side here and going down uh, into another uh, dredge to be pushed further down. So I said at one point in time, this was the longest dredging line that operated anywhere. This was like a 12-mile long dredging line because they had no place else to put it. They just kept pushing it further downstream. And actually, that was like around Redding in some areas where they didn't have a place to put it. They didn't just like pump it downstream like this where they were putting it. They actually just dredged it downstream, and then they went downstream and they dredged it downstream until they could get it to a basin. So it's also interesting because along with this, it's not just the dredging that's happening. Um, Governor Duff is pushing uh, um, the uh, industrial treatment, sewage treatment. And so you have people saying, well, you know, we sort of need to know when a stream is clean. How do we know that? So Sanitary Water Board commissioned some studies from the Academy of Natural Sciences. So some of these foundational studies that are done on macroinvertebrates using them as indicators of stream health are done in association with this project um, to be able to come up with these metrics for telling us when a stream is clean. And those, those studies sort of came out of, they were funded by uh, this uh, effort to come up with, well, OK, how do we know when a stream is clean? We need some way to measure that. Now, I talked a lot about the coal sediment. Uh, I did not talk a lot about mine drainage because this project had absolutely nothing to do with mine drainage. So what part of the problems that you have is the, uh, this cleanup was criticized afterwards because you still have a Schuylkill River that is still being harmed by untreated mine drainage. And um, just to kind of give you an idea, like I said, mine drainage issues continue to be with us today. Um, but this is, this is about 15 years apart. So the stream on the left, that is a stream impacted by mine drainage on the left-hand side. 15 years later, after a treatment system has been installed, you know, again, if you were to go to the stream on the left-hand side and try to pick up a rock of that stream bed, you wouldn't be able to because that material, that precipitate is coating those rocks. They're sort of like cemented in there. So again, on the right-hand side, you now have a stream that is flowing much cleaner because of work that has been done to clean the stream up. 
But again, up into the 60s, there would continue to be this, this idea, again, going back to, oh, well, you know, this, this mine drainage is important. It helps us kill the bad stuff in the water. That even, even as finally in the 1960s, by 1964, where that is being brought under control, it is being going to need to be treated, you're not going to be able to discharge that mine drainage, that argument was still being made, even though, interestingly enough, you go back to the 19, about 1950, you have... Um, uh, an engineer with the city of Reading who said, no, this is completely false. And he had done research and he published research on this that, and, and corresponded with, with Governor Duff about it that that argument was a false argument, that you, it just really didn't work and he could show you based on his own monitoring, his own research around the city of Reading. So, um, and again, part of what happens after this is the Schuylkill River uh, becomes uh, Pen Pennsylvania's first scenic river. And one of the implications of that was when the state mined out these basins through uh, contracting with Stoutsbury Preparation Company, after these basins were mined out, when they decided to excess or to sell these, these lands, they now have to be sold in um, an appropriate way that's, that's uh, compatible with the Scenic River designation. So as a result, most of these spaces, uh, if they... Uh, have been transferred out of state ownership, have gone to county or municipal governments where they tend to be used in some way as active passive recreation today. Um, so we have uh, the uh, 1995, we have the region gains recognition as a heritage park. Uh, in 1999, you have the, the um, Schuylkill Sojourn held, the first Schuylkill Sojourn, uh, DCNR's River of the Year 1999 to 2014. We have River of the Year again. So again, the Schuylkill River looks much different today um, than the Schuylkill River that we were looking at just a few slides ago. And I think um, that when you look back at the final words of the Schuylkill River project engineers, I think it's good guidance for us to continue because the river always is going to have threats uh, that are going to endanger its health. It's going to endanger the kind of river that we're going to leave future generations. So we have to look at what was done to give us the Schuylkill River we have today and think about the investment that was put into the Schuylkill River. So I think that we should uh, hope that future administrations, I would say future generations as well, will not permit the Schuylkill River to be despoiled again. And with that, um, I think we can open it up for some questions. <laughs> What's the effect of these storage ponds currently along the river in terms of groundwater or the impact on the river acid mine drains, that type of thing? Is there still an impact? Well, you know, because again, um, what, as far as like the acid mine drainage, um, that what you're, like I said, the, the basins for the most part have been mined out as much of the material. Like, now again, um, if you go walking in these basins, if, for that matter, if you go and just dig your hand into the Schuylkill River, you're going to see particles of coal. Um, it's going to be, you know, you're never going to be able to remove that coal again. I, and again, it's like for the acid mine drainage, remember you're talking about the pyrites that are associated with the coal. So, um, you know, there's, there are places where, you know, you still have those, you know, in the headwaters where you have that problem, you still have mine drainage in the headwaters. I think as far as the, the, the basins themselves, like I said, so many of them have been um, turned into recreational facilities. Now, there, like, there can be some issues with, um, like Black Rock Sanctuary, my understanding is one of the things that they struggle with is that the, um, it's because again, it's kind of been uh, uh, converted to wetland and wildlife habitat, bird habitat, bird sanctuary. And but one of the problems seems to be um, when they were doing the work on that project was getting uh, the wetland right and also that one of the issues was it tended to warm up. It tends to warm up uh, earlier than it really should. And there's some concern as well, is that because of the, the coal that's in it? I uh, wonder if you could talk a little bit about the um, dam removal aspects of the project. Because um, I imagine as, as a rower, you might have mixed feelings about the existence of the remaining dams um, creating the slackwater pool. Well, for the dams that were on the river were for the canal system, and that was a slack water system where um, you know you were in the river, and then when you got to the canal, you came out or got to the, the dam, you'd come out into the, the 
the canals and, and move around the dams. Um, and the dams did create you know, recreational areas. And, um, and that was actually when, the pro when this process was underway, when the dams were being removed for this project, uh, removal of the dams was controversial in some of these communities, um, especially because what would happen is people would see like, oh, wow, look at that. They've been dredging in this area, and the river's so much cleaner up there. Well, we, we want our dam. We want to keep our dam now because you've cleaned the river up. And, um, and, and so these people would argue, and it's interesting to see what some of the comments, um, and, and again, a lot of the people working in DEP, at DT, working in the Department of Forests and Waters at the time, uh, were former military men, and they sort of had <laughs> this approach where, uh, you know, we would talk about um, public meetings and public comment, and it doesn't really, while there were public meetings, it sort of really sounds like the process was we're removing the dams, and we're really sorry that you don't like it, but that's what we're going to do anyway. Um, and, and their process, what they, what they said was, you know, that when they went through and were removing these dams is like, you don't understand if we leave the dam, we're trapping the silt. We're taking the dams out because we're going to take the silt out. So, um, the, um, you know, again, like I said, you've had, you've had, um, uh, you know, the dam at Fairmont that creates the, the, the pool that is, uh, heavily rode on and that I heavily rode on. And, and that's always going to be a special place for me, but. Again, you know, when you look at what dams do, and we're going to have a couple of presentations on dams today. When you look at what dams do, what you know is that they interrupt, uh, they interrupt the, the stream's flow. They cause problems upstream of the dam. They cause problems downstream of the dam. You know, streams are better free flowing. Um, so, uh, but there seems like there's another part of your question there. I'm not sure that I answered. Um, well, in terms of oh, well, for the, the the dam removal that happened with the project. Well, so, yeah, so, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, there were 32 navigation dams, and right. is it correct that there are four navigation dams remaining? I think there's seven dams total, but some of those are um, were part of the project. They were built as part of the project. Uh, Auburn and Kernsville are the ones that were built as part of the project, but now there were dams that had been in those areas before, not necessarily as big as what you have there now. Um, so yeah, the um, and again, you, know, like you hear that number about the 32 dams, and, and, and again, like to, uh, you, know, you have to think of that a lot of those dams were, um, again, much smaller. And, and you will still have people that kind of remember those dams and, and want them back. But yeah, a lot of dams were actually removed in the process to keep the water moving downstream, keep the water moving the sediment downstream. They also built temporary dams for the project because in some places there was not enough water to float the dredges. So they would build temporary dams so that they, and these dams actually had these kind of sort of washboards on that they could lift up if they needed to trap more flow to be able to have more water to be able to do the dredging. So, you know, again, like I said, there was, there was a lot of sort of different moving parts to the process. Um, and, and like I said, yeah, there was a lot of, of uh, effort to um, really open up, you know, they're, they're, what they're called, it's like I said, they called a lot of channel rectification. Just they wanted to open it up so this system could just move sediment downstream. That was really their goal is the river needs to move. And they did what they could to get everything out of the way that stopped that. During the time that uh, the dredging was at its peak in the Philadelphia area, did it have an added impact on the potability of the water in Philadelphia? Uh, the dredging um, would, the impact that the dredging would have had, not necessarily when it was in, uh, because since Philadelphia is taking its water from further upstream, um, the impact actually would have been uh, happening in, early in the dredging process. And I'm, I'm, I need to remember now if I can, I'm going to get these figures right, because there was a measurement, now it's not, I don't have measurements for the Philadelphia area, but to give you an idea of one, the, the change in water quality, one of the measures was the suspended sediment load, and they were measuring it up at Burn, uh, which is, again, up above Reading. Um, but in 1948, they went from, they measured, they projected the amount of sediment that they had, and it was being projected about the annual amount of sediment per acre, and I believe it was over 3,000 tons of suspended, suspended sediment in 1948 being measured at burn, and it went to 40 by the end of the project. 
So that that's so when you're thinking about you know the, what part of the impact on city of Philadelphia is water um, during that period of time, one of the big impacts would have been during the course of this project, the amount of sediment that was being in Philadelphia's water was going to be dropping considerably. And um, there's a and I know Philadelphia Water Department has it in their archives somewhere because I saw a presentation Ed Grishesky gave at one point that has um, was a peer, a cartoon that appeared in a military. Um, publication, and it's uh, there's a soldier on the ground. He's got his cupped hand, he's, and he's taking water out of a puddle. And there's two higher-ranking officers standing behind him, and uh, the one officer is saying to another officer, saying, "He's from Philadelphia. He'll drink anything." <laughs> so, Philadelphia definitely. And it, during the period of this time, just um, there was a lot of push for Philadelphia to turn away to another uh, water supply. They were going to bring water from the water gap. Actually, there was, there was a lot of chutzpah. And one, at one point in time, you have a mine operator saying that he's, he's got a, 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 a strip mine that is filled with water. And he was going to offer that to the city of Philadelphia. He said, well, you can use your drinking water here. Um, and I was like, you know, that's, you know, you, you've got a, you, you've got a, you know, a lot of uh, uh, nerve to uh, suggest that after sending a lot of sediment downstream that, that uh, endangered the city's water supply, that um, you're now going to offer one of your, your filled-in strip mines as the city's drinking water supply. But during that period of time, and like I said, the city of Philadelphia actually had employed someone in the early part of the 1900s, employed someone whose job was to sue polluters on behalf of the city of Philadelphia, because there really wasn't a framework early on for regulating, other than using nuisance and trespass laws, there really wasn't a framework for regulating these kinds of discharges. Um, so that was the way that they, they did it. They actually went after, City of Philadelphia sued um, in the late 1800s, sued 20 mining companies, which said that, okay, we're going to stop. We'll stop discharging sediment. So they basically said, you're trespassing on our property by the amount of sediment that you're sending downstream. And the... Um, there was a settlement in the case, and they actually reopened the case in the early 40s because the city said, look, they're not doing it. We get to reopen this case. And they had to go to court to be able to reopen it, and they did actually get the case reopened right around the time all of this happened. And there really was, um, uh, there was actually, a, in the course of doing it, there's a, there's a, a quote from a judge where the judge is, is saying, you know, we really think, Philadelphia, you should turn and look to a different water supply. It would be much easier, much cheaper to get a different water supply than to try to clean up the Schuylkill River. And the thing is, the fact that Philadelphia did not do that is really probably very important in the story. Um, at the same time, Pottstown was looking at whether could it dam the Manitoni and get enough water from the Manitoni to avoid using the Schuylkill River. If communities had stopped, part of Duff's ability to push this project through was talking about the industry, the people, the need of southeastern Pennsylvania to have a water supply that they could use. And if suddenly everybody, oh, well, you know, we're going to go get our water from the Water Gap, we're going to get our water from the Manitoni, if there hadn't been a need, um, even as this river was being cleaned up, industries and the regulations were uh, coming down that were going to make it more difficult uh, to kind of just status quo and to try to do more to clean up. There were arguments that were trying to be made as well, you know, the Schuylkill is so polluted, we shouldn't have to uh, worry about what we're discharging to it because you're never going to be able to clean it up anyway. They kind of wanted to set this tier uh, of uh, levels of streams. You know, we have our, our tiers of streams, the warm water, cold water, uh, you know, we have exceptional value streams. They had this tier that they wanted to create where um, uh, you had a stream that would be so polluted that it was never going to be cleaned up and you'd be able to do anything to that. That would be your base. And that would have been the Schuylkill. But Governor Duff said, no, we're not going to have that. So again, that's one of the reasons why, for me, Governor Duff is a very important person in this story. I think Ruth is wrapping us up. Um, I think we actually officially get started upstairs. Thank you all, by the way. Um, <laughs>